I'm Thomas, this is the RPG Chronicles, and today it's old school fastest Star Trek the role playing game. So it's time to be a little hipster and present the first tutorial for the original Star Trek role playing game. With a first glance at the character sheet, it's easy to notice a lot that is similar to typical RPGs a list of stats that make up the abilities of the character, or, or as they're called in fastest Star Trek, attributes, as well as a rather detailed list of skills and identifying data. In addition to the standard fare, there's also a section called AP, which is related to the character's movements and activity in an encounter scenario, action points, and the service experience chart that is used during character creation, but also a record of the character's previous history in Starfleet before the current assignment. This video, though, is going to focus on the attributes. There are a total of seven abilities, strength, endurance, intelligence, dexterity, charisma, luck, and psionic ability. The character is assigned a number between 1 and 100 in each category based on rolling 3d10 plus 40 on all rolls except for luck and psi, which require a straight d100. After the dice roll, additions or subtractions are made to those numbers based on racial modifiers in all categories except for human characters who are considered normative in the Star Trek universe. Despite our normativity in all things, though, humans do take a racial negative 30 in psionic ability. We aren't too good at using our brains to their full capacity, after all. A normal person is expected to have a 40 in all categories except psi, which is left unstated, but probably close to 1. Starfleet officers, though, are exceptional, beyond average, um, which is why there is the additional 3d10. After the racial modifiers have been added, the player rolls a final D100 and divides it by 2 and rounds up. Yeah, there's a lot of math involved. This calculated number represents bonus points that a player can add to any character stats except psionic ability, with two ex additional exceptions. No more than plus 30 on any attribute, nor an attribute above 99 from bonus points. The purpose of the bonus points is to allow a player to develop their particular character as they want to roleplay that person. The recommended stat distribution is to begin all stats, except for luck and psionic ability, as even as possible. But I'll talk more on optimizing your character towards the end. Before getting into the specifics of the racial modifiers, a word on what each of those attributes signify. In general, they're fairly self-explanatory, and the Game Master can use any of them to call for an attribute check to determine the success or failure of a task. As expected, Strength is related to a character's physical power, how much she or he can lift, move, carry, or bash something. The number is understood to reflect the character's ability while in perfect health, and can be temporarily lowered through GM modifiers if the player is injured, fatigued, or ill. Nevertheless, the Game Operations Manual, that's the Game Master's Guide, and the Starfleet Officer's Manual, the Player's Guide, both state that in-scenario in combat injuries do not affect the character's strength. For instance, if a support beam falls on a PC and they're still conscious, that PC can still use his or her strength attribute during the scene to assist in the removal of the beam. It is possible, however, that after the encounter, without any medical assistance or rest, it can affect the player's strength going forward. Other than the scenario just described, it will most often be used in determining effectiveness in unarmed combat, as well as the damage amount. A Game Master is certainly able to find creative means to utilize this stat elsewhere during game play, though. Finally, the manual also states that the bare minimum for a Starfleet officer in this attribute is 50. A score of 50 is equivalent to a carry capacity of 50 pounds for a lengthy amount of time without tiring, or lifting 150 pounds without strain, or dragging a 200 pound object for a short duration without exhaustion. Unfortunately, there is no further information though to determine any other equivalencies. But a good rule of thumb might be to take the score and have that be the PC's ability to carry, uh, lifting times 3 and the score times 4 as the number of pounds able to be dragged. Endurance is what other systems might call constitution. It reflects, as the Starfleet Officer's Manual says, quote, how much abuse and neglect the body can take, going on to say the body's defense against damage. In-game, this attribute is one that will not typically be used for a saving role, role, but is important in several other mechanics of the system. It is used to determine your maximum operating endurance, current operating endurance, wound healing rate, and fatigue healing rate. In other words, how much damage your character's body is able to sustain, as well as the rates at which the PC heals when being aided by medical personnel or from simply resting. One example of how it might be used apart from its function in your PC's health is if your character has been captured and is being tortured for information. There are four things. But, as with any other attribute, in-game situations may temporarily or possibly permanently change your PC's endurance. 
After several days of non-stop action without rest, your character might have a negative modifier added by the GM. Intellect, rather straightforward attribute. It measures the intellectual capacity of the character. The importance of this characteristic is that the intellect score directly corresponds to the number of skills a Starfleet officer has, of which there is a minimum of 50, with several more added through various additional manuals and subcategories to the prime game manuals. The skills are what enables you to do things in game. And it also determines how difficult it's going to be for your character to gain new skills, depending upon your intelligence score. Various skills will be discussed in more detail later, but for now, it's best to understand skills in terms of how a character improves. Fastest Star Trek does not have a traditional leveling up system. Following each session, the player is able to add a certain amount of points to their various skills with an emphasis on those utilized in session. The amount to be added depends on the GM's style of gameplay, but are connected to proficiency in a skill, a skill roll, which has been affected by the intellect score or through an intellect saving throw. There's no minimum intellect score for a Starfleet officer, but as you can probably tell, it doesn't pay to be average or even only slightly above average in this category. The player character's physical abilities, the non-strength related ones, are determined through the dexterity score. In general, this score is used to determine a PC's agility, balance, reaction time, and the like. It's also one of the principal mechanics for combat. It has, it has a place both in unarmed, how quickly and precisely you can administer one of those infamous TNG open-handed punches, and armed attacks. If a character wants to dodge out of the way when a Romulan fires a disruptor, the reaction and reflexes are tested through dexterity. One of the other key game mechanics on which dexterity is based is the number of action points a player or character possesses. Every activity in a round requires a set number of action points, and a PC with more action points are able to do more things. Just to give an example, when Lieutenant Worf is fighting with, well, whomever is fighting this episode, and he turns to his right to confront another enemy, that turn movement costs one action point. Just to be clear, everything done in round costs action points. Good strategy also requires that some of those action points be reserved during your turn in order to react to something another PC or NPC might do in round, like dropping suddenly to avoid a battle that requires one action point. So unless you like a sword taken off your head, you at least want to save one of those points. Moving along, Charisma is not how good-looking or attractive a player character is. In the world of Star Trek, with its myriad of species and long histories of interspecies dating and uh, <coughs> copulation, it's not heavily dependent on the social acceptance of any one particular race's notion of beauty. The Starfleet Officer's Manual defines charisma, the character attribute that describes personal magnetism, the overall impressiveness of a character's personality. More important is force of personality or will. Despite the previous statement, the Game Operation Manual provides an example of a charisma check as how well a character is able to catch the eye of intention of a member of the opposite sex. So I'm not sure how much it is about the personality, or the will of a player, or that PC's physical attractiveness, which is why the game system leaves this characteristic a little on the vague side and open to interpretation by the players and GM. So it's more often combined with a skill check, such as combining diplomacy and charisma when attempting to get better trading rights between the Federation and the Ferengi. Good luck with that. Speaking of which, an attribute that was specifically added because the majority of PCs expected in Fastest Star Trek were humans is luck, and humans like to play the odds. As a normal part of the game mechanics, luck doesn't really play a role. For instance, you would never combine luck with one of the PC skills in order to determine the results of an action because it would make a successful role, in most cases, much more difficult. So what's it for? For when things really go wrong in game. Remember, player characters are the heroes of this adventure. The Kirks, the Picards, the Wars, the Parises, the Odos, and the Yarses. Wait, that's a bad example. You get my point. They aren't red shirts. But there is a lot out there that can kill a player. You do not want to be on the wrong side of a Romulan disruptor. Luck can be used to turn a direct hit into a graze. This mechanic allows for the impossible to become a reality. It doesn't mean that the PCs can't die, nor that missions will always be successful, but it does give that one last opportunity, one last chance to make things work for the players. Because if it wasn't for a little bit of luck, the Emperor's would have lost at Kittimer. Where's that damn torpedo? She's ready, Jim. Lock and load. Fire. To be, or not to be. Target that explosion and fire. 
fire! The thoroughly non-human ability added to the game was psionic ability. Similar to luck, the psionic attribute really only applies to one race, the Vulcans. All other races receive massive negative modifiers to this stat. It doesn't mean Grawl can't have massive psionic ability. Remember, it's all in the fate of a D100 roll. But the best possible case scenario is 60. The lack of human psionic ability means that it is not something Starfleet really tests for, nor helps cadets develop. So if a player character even does end up with a high psionic ability, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily something that will be developed. There's only a chance it will be detected and given the opportunity to travel to Vulcan in order to have his or her talent honed. But then again, I'm sure Grawl's constant complaints would be too much lack of emotional control that he wouldn't want to stay on Vulcan for very long. Again, as with luck, its only real in-game function is to see if a Vulcan character can perform a psionic activity such as a mind meld, and then whether or not a character is able to withstand that psionic activity. As demonstrated though in Plato's Stepchildren, resisting the power of some form of mind control can be quite difficult. With the introduction of the Next Generation sourcebook in 1988, you would think that Betazoids might have become a playable character, but you'd be wrong. The edition recognizes the psionic ability of the Betazoids, but a strange twist declares that many Federation personnel resent the inclusion of Betazoids among them. However, fearing that the impasse will invade their privacy, a wave of protests have limited the admittance of Betazoids to Starfleet Academy. And yet they're also expected, though, to be counselors on the new Federation ships, but the rank as commander is more symbolic than actual. Go figure. After the attribute scores have been assigned, they will not generally change. At the discretion of the GM, they might be reconfigured because of events that occur in your character's storyline, but to be permanently changed, a significant event would need to occur, which makes sense. An individual's intellectual capacity doesn't normally change unless some outside action occurs. Perhaps an experimental technology has been added to a player's mind, giving them higher cognitive function, such as the case with Lieutenant Julian Bashir. Or Q has decided to turn someone into a Superman, giving them extraordinary strength. But outside these story arcs, the numbers are set by the end of character creation. In the Star Trek world, not every species is the same. And so the choice of a player's character's race affects their attributes. And I think given Star Trek's long association with social issues, issues even in the early 1980s when this game was produced, it did not provide any negative modifiers if a player wanted to play a female character, which could not always have been said for other RPGs at the time. The racial modifiers correspond well with Star Trek canon, so PCs who are Vulcan or Andorian receive positive strength modifiers, plus 20 and plus 10 respectively, whereas the Catons and Adoans' agility is demonstrated through plus 25 and plus 15 through the dexterity attribute. Not all the modifiers are positive, though. As mentioned, everybody but the Vulcans are penalized on psionic abilities, and everybody but humans are penalized on luck. The remainder of the attributes, again, return to canon expectation. When deciding how to optimize a player character with bonus points, the Game Master's Guide provides some tips. I disagree with some of those suggestions, but will present my thoughts after what FASA provides. The first recommendation that is given in the Game Operations Manual is to have all the attributes as close to even as possible and to use the bonus points to achieve it. The rationale given is that it creates a PC who is a jack-of-all-trades and one who is, quote, the easiest to play. But it also recognizes that in many ways a non-exceptional character is not the most fun. Adding the bonus point changes, it says, the character in great ways. FASA recommends adding bonus points to the, to the attributes in what it considers order of importance. First being intelligence, then luck, followed by endurance, dexterity, strength, and finally charisma. As I mentioned earlier, you cannot use bonus points to increase psionic ability. Intelligence is labeled as the single most important attribute because it allows for a greater amount of skills, which are essential in this game. As a result, they recommend a minimum of 60 in this category, and preferably 70. The same recommendation is also made for luck. Attempt to get it to 70, but realizing the game mechanic, rolling an initial D100, may make it impossible to raise the stat to that level. Luck is listed high here because in the fastest Star Trek universe, luck can be the last line of defense that allows the 100 to 1 shot to succeed when General Chang can fire photon torpedoes while cloaked and the Klingon bird of prey. Well, the thing's got to have a tailpipe. Doctor, would you care to assist me in performing surgery on a torpedo? Endurance, dexterity, and strength follow in the list because of their use during combat. Charisma is listed last in importance according to the Game Master's Manual because charisma adds only, as it says, to the character's persuasive ability with NPCs. So that is how FASA recommends optimizing characters by adding bonus points to attributes in order of importance. 
I look at optimization from a different lens. In the final analysis, how a character is optimized should be based on the types of missions being run. Granted, the characters are on a Federation starship and anything can happen, but what story does the GM like to run? If it is more in line with TOS missions, combat may be on the heavier side of things, and so endurance and dexterity may need to play a larger role. Are the missions more investigative? Then intelligence and luck are going to be important. Diplomatic missions will require a greater reliance on charisma. Starfleet assigns personnel as qualified on various ships, so should players and GMs. In other words, as with FASA and most other RPG games, there isn't one right way to build a PC. And don't forget that sometimes the most memorable moments in RPG gaming is when a player character is completely out of her or his depth and finds a unique way of solving the problem as only that PC possibly could. Even the quarks of the universe have their heroic plot points. All right, everyone relax. No harm done. We still have our prisoner. What's that? It's the alarm I set up. It means a Dominion ship is approaching. To the infirmary! Let's go! I also have some other videos on playing fast as Star Trek, so consider taking a look at some of those. And there's also more to come, too. And if you like what you've seen, why not share this video? Hit the subscribe and notification icon to be alerted when new videos are uploaded. If you have any questions or want to know about a specific element of Fast as Star Trek, put them down below in the comments. So until next time, keep that gutsy gnome away from your dice.